Hi there, this is Jenny again, and we're going to be talking about men's health this time. We talked about women's health on the last one. As you can see, this graph compared to the women's graph, we are much more complicated, right? <laughs> we are so intricate and delicate, huh? So anyways, uh, this one is a lot easier to understand. When you think of testosterone, testosterone is the male hormone. We have um, um, estrogen, and they have testosterone. When you think of testosterone, think of it being an androgen. Androgens include testosterone, which we'll talk about. Uh, we still have, men always still have the follicle stimulating and the luteinizing hormone coming from the pituitary, which is being talked to from the hypothalamus. Uh, we have the ovarian and the ovulation where they have uh, making of the sperm and sperm release. And so again, the ma main primary reason is for um, making of a baby. And also testosterone, testosterone, though, is for hair growth and puberty in males. So again, androgens. We have androgens here on the right-hand side. Think of testosterone as being an androgen. There's other androgens that are made, but really testosterone is the main one that's made in the testes. Um, women have androgens, too. They're called, I believe, preandrogens, something like that, um, and the adrenal cortex, which is on, sits on top of your kidneys. Testosterone is the main one, and as I had mentioned on the last slide, it's for the male sex characteristics. Okay, so males have testosterone, and yes, females have the preandrogens, and it's for puberty and making sperm. Now, there's anabolic steroids that uh, some of these athletes are not supposed to take, but they do. Uh, it's a schedule of Three. When you think of schedules, think of sched these are how we prescribe our uh, narcotics. Schedule um, three would be equi equivalent to like a Tylenol with codeine. Uh, schedule three used to be Vicodin, and now that's a schedule two because of all the misuse. S schedule one is heroin. Schedule two is all your morphines and Percocets and Vicodin. Schedule three, this would fit into this area. Um, so I've never prescribe them. I've never seen them or used them, but these are them. Um, they're not they're not really good to take and as you know because they can be misused very easily. It increases tissue, it increases muscle mass basically. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit now about the medications. Well, which I did mention these medications here. We're going to dig more into the other medications. Um, but what are some adverse effects? So if you take the anabolic, excuse me, steroids, um, it can cause virilization. What is virilization? That is basically overgrowth of muscle, hair, uh, male characteristics. Uh, premature epiphyseal closure, that is with the, um, uh, the, Uh, growth plates that you have in your body so it can cause those to close prematurely so if you're taking them uh, as a young person or let's just say that uh, you have that specific androgen uh, naturally produced in your body that is overproducing you're going to have premature closure so you can have growth issues uh, toxicity of the liver effects on cholesterol levels you should not use it in pregnancy it can cause prostate cancer edema, fluid, which would be more fluid overload, and gynecomastia, which is enlarged breasts, and then abuse potential. Androgen preparations for patients. Uh, so the, we're still on the clinical pharmacology of the androgens. So androgen preparations, why is it used? It's used, um, number one, their testosterone level is low. So that's primarily why it's used. And it needs to be really below normal because there are some adverse reactions, which was mentioned on this slide, that it can cause cancer. And actually we're finding out more in the research that it has really uh, more uh, um, adverse reactions or I would say an increased risk of heart issues, cancer, uh, than we once thought. So we have to be really careful. And so a lot of us in primary care don't even prescribe it and just refer over to the urologist because, again, you have to weigh the risk versus the benefits. Uh, so how are they feeling versus what are the risks of putting them on a testosterone replacement? But some of the 
symptoms that they have with low testosterone are what here on the picture, which I'm sure you've read through as I'm talking. Um, but you have, can have some small testicles, um, bald, you start get becoming bald, you're not growing hair anymore. Just think like the lack of. So think of testosterone and what that does, and now you have the lack of testosterone. So you're not going to have any hair growth or you're going to have more um, premature, or not premature, but um, more not female characteristics other than the pubic hair pattern can turn into that. So here's some anabolic steroid abuse by athletes. I think it looks really gross, so I'm not sure why people think, people become obsessed, no different than anorex, anorexia nervosa, where they think they're fat and they're really not fat, they look terrible. So it's, you wonder if this is some sort of, it's psychological disease to me, that why people would take that. So it has a lot of risk to it. All right, so now we're gonna talk about, so we focus a little bit on that, and now we're going to talk about drugs for erectile dysfunction and benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is an enlarged prostate. Enlarged prostate uh, primarily happens as you age. All right, so erectile dysfunction, it used to be known as impotence. Uh, we got rid of that diagnosis code, and now it's erectile dysfunction. Impotence just was not a good word. Um, I have no idea why, but... I like erectile dysfunction better. Anyway, so what is erectile dysfunction? So it's the inability to achieve an erection or sustain an erection suit suitable for satisfactory sexual performance. Okay, sorry, I had to yell at my dogs. All right, so let me go back here just a little bit. Erectile dysfunction, what are the causes of erectile dysfunction? A majority of erectile dysfunction is caused from psychological reasons, whether people have gone through divorce or don't even realize they have stress in their lives and they have erectile dysfunction. The one question that you should always ask, or me as a clinician always ask, if they're having issues, I'll say, "Are you? do you wake up with a morning erection? And if they say yes most of the time, then I know it's working. If they say no, then maybe there is something more... Uh, internally going on, such as people with cardiovascular disease, because think of vascular disease. You have vessels in the penis, so if you have vascular disease going on in your legs and your heart arteries, you can have vascular disease there, so you're not going to get the blood flow. Uh, but psychologically, psychological issues are um, a huge thing, and this is actually, you guys might think this is kind of funny, but this has actually been done, and it's been in some of the, in the textbooks. For erectile dysfunction, you have them put um, a roll of stamps around the penis, and they go to bed at night, and if they wake up in the morning and that's broken, then you know you, they've had an erection. I know it sounds kind of goofy, but hey, I used to work in urology, so we're used to talking about this stuff. All right, so what are some treatments for erectile dysfunction? Well, first-line treatments are what's called PDE5 inhibitors, um, which is your Viagra, Cialis, and your Levitra. There's other oral ones that are out there. There used to be Staxin, but I haven't seen Staxin out for a long time. There's also your non-oral agents, Papaverin and your Phentolamine and l -prostadil. Now, those are injectables into the penis. And those are usually, so I worked in urology, and that is what we would use in urology because usually they'd end up failing the oral medications and they'd be referred to us. And so we would have them do those. Also, talking to somebody, because again, a lot of it's psychological. Once you have that issue with erectile dysfunction a couple times, it really bothers men. And so sometimes that can trip them for subsequent um, uh, issues. Also, uh, usually last case scenario is surgical implantation of penile prosthesis. So what it does, it has a, a pump, which is this picture here, and when you want an erection, you just pump it up with your hand. And I used to have to take care of those in the hospital years ago. So that was not, not fun. Um, all right, because when they put the penile prosthesis in, they're erect, and so what you have to do is try to get it to relax and go back down. So anyways, that's a side story. <laughs> that was not good. 
All right, so what are some adverse effects? So what is what is what do these drugs do? They relax the blood vessels so blood can flow through so they can get an erection. All right, so Viagra's one of them. There's I have a YouTube video I'll have you watch. I'll post up there. Um, think about the increased blood flow of what um, this does. Increases blood flow to the area. So there's also Viagra, which is called, or Sildenafil, which is called Revatio, that's used for pulmonary, pulmonary artery hypertension. And that relaxes the vessels to get the blood flowing through. It's the same thing as Viagra. Uh, but it's called Revatio, and the dosing is different. So you can't say, here's Viagra for your pulmonary artery hypertension, and here's Revatio for your erectile dysfunction. Although the YouTube video focuses the difference between the two, you don't have to know Revatio at all. Just know, I want you to know really what it's doing in the body and why these medications work for erectile dysfunction. So let's just say here now it's uh, increasing blood flow, dilating your vessels. So what can it cause? Low blood pressure, right? Um, it can cause preopism, which is an, a, a rec, an erection that will not go away, as you see in the commercials. An erection greater than four hours, blah, blah, blah. Headache, dyspepsia, these are all things that would happen if you have uh, dilation of your blood vessels. It's not specific to the penis, it goes everywhere in the body. So you can have these issues. Uh, one other thing, you can have obstructive sleep apnea issues. Some rare side effects are you can have some ischemic optic neuropathy. So if they have trouble uh, seeing, think about this drug and say, no more of this, I need you to go see an eye doctor. Sudden hearing loss, it's very rare that happens, but again, that's a side effect. I see a lot of people with nasal congestion um, as a side effect. Um, usually it's better if they take um, on an empty stomach or and usually it's an hour before with the Viagra um, intercourse. If you take a high fat meal it's not absorbed as fast. Again the drug interactions do not, it's contraindicated with nitrites, nitrates. So if people take nitroglycerin or even nitrodur which is for hypo, hypertension, take any of those, think about putting those two combos together. They're both dilating the vessels. They can have life-threatening hypotension. So make sure um, we either don't put them on it or we tell them to wait 24 hours, although I usually will not put them on it. Or working in urology, we would just be a little bit more careful with that because we are specialty, so we would tend to maybe say wait 24 hours. There's some um, alpha blockers also, which is... Uh, your Flomax, doxazosin, which we'll talk about in another slide. Those can also cause hypotension. That's for um, um, prostate enlargement. It also drops your blood pressure. So if you mix that with this, you're going to get um, additive effects. Also inhibitors of cytochrome P450, uh, CYP3A4. These are this is the, in the liver, and there's many medications out there, such as old antidepressants. There's many other ones that go through that specific pathway to metabolize. Well, Viagra does too, so it can suppress that metabolism if the two are put together. So anybody with the following should be really careful. If you've had an MI, a stroke, any life-threatening dysrhythmia within the last six months, if you have uh, hypotension as it is or hypertension as it is, heart failure, unstable angina, because think it's just, um, it's dilating the vessels. So if anybody has any heart disease or arrhythmias, it can mess up that system. And then it says men should not be used at all by t men taking nitroglycerin. So it's just kind of contradictory to this one before 24 hours between these medications. Um, like I just said here, I it's really in primary cares, we usually just stay away from it. And I'd say go to urology and specialty, we may do that, but really just stay away from it. So as far as your nursing boards and stuff, really they should not be taking that with any nitroglycerin or any other drug in the nitrate family. Levitra is another uh, medication similar to Viagra. This relaxes the arterial and trabecular smooth muscle in the penis. And adverse effects, the same thing. One other adverse effect that's extra to this one though, it can prolong a QT interv interval and that is basically your heart rhythm.
So I don't know if you've done um, EKGs or cardiology, but in the EKG it goes P, Q, R, S, P, Q, you can't see me, can you? <laughs> Never mind, P, Q, Q, R, S, T. Um, the Q, R, S is your ventricle firing off and that blood's pumping through and the P wave is the atrium uh, firing blood going into the ventricle. So that QT, T is when it's at resting, that QT interval can become prolonged and that can cause um, um, life-threatening issues. Also the sudden hearing loss. So the relaxing arterial and trabecular smooth muscles, the same thing for the Viagra. All right, now we have Cialis. Cialis is the longest acting out of all of them, and actually some people can take it um, every day, and it's approved for prostate issues too. Um, it, again, really, it relaxes the smooth muscles, the arteries, and the trabecular smooth muscles. It can last up to 36 hours. It's the longest of all three of them, and now approved of da for daily dosing. Adverse effects are the same things. And um, so I'm not going to read through those, but it's the same things. It's the same class. It's working the same way. The only other thing is with the um, Levitra, uh, it can cause the prolongation in the QT interval. But you're going to have the same issues with all three of them regarding interactions, um, the side effects, uh, drug interactions, same thing. All right, so let's talk about other drugs for erectile dysfunction. These are the um, ones that you inject directly into the um, uh, corpus cavernosum. So you direct on the side of the penis, you inject directly in there. What we usually do is we would do, this is only done in specialty clinics, or should be, and these things are kept refrigerated, they're injectables, um, they're more expensive. They have to have failed other treatments in order to get this. And um, usually we do a trial in the office just to make sure they're not having any adverse reactions to it or having any issues. So um, it's used to counteract erectile dysfunction. Again, the same adverse effects. They can have a prolonged erection. Eventually you can get some nodule, fib fibrotic nodules in the corpus cavernosum where you're injecting it. And then again, the orthostatic hypotension. And this is another one which is increases the arterial flow and the venous outflow of the penis. So it's a little bit different than this one. Oh, no, this is the same. These are a little bit different than the, um, um, the Cialis Levitra and the Viagra. These are, they do increase arterial flow. The decreased venous outflow, that's the new, um, indicate, new reason for these drugs. It works in a different way. Okay, so as far as this one, it's the same thing as the other one. And um, Caverject is one name for that, for this type of medication. That's the brand name. Should not be used more than three times per week or once in 24 hours. You can get a burning sensation, prolonged erection, peel now, fibrosis. And um, this one here is the Caverject. And this one here is Muse. So those are little pellets um, that um, get injected directly in that area and um, transurethral yeah the muse is transurethral so just sorry because i'm trying to get these straight in my head again so there is uh two of these kinds one is muse and they come in pellets and they get injected put right into the um they get put right into the urethra that's what muse is they're little pellets okay they just you can inject them in they give you a little contraption. You don't use more than two in 24 hours, but these don't cause the preopism or penile fibrosis because it's going right into the urethra and it's less likely or not really likely to cause that issue with the erection. Whereas the alprostadil uh, is the other one and that is directly into the corpus cavernosum. But that can cause issues like the fib fibrosis and stuff. So. Okay, so enough of erectile dysfunction, right? Um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. 
So what happens as we get older, we age, things age, our hormones change, excessive um, growth can happen. So if we have a lack of some hormones, we can have excessive growth of some cells and smooth muscles, just the aging process. And it's a prostate enlargement. And so the prostate, when you look at this picture, is a normal prostate's here. So we always say it's like a walnut. So when I do a prostate exam, I should feel a small walnut, not feel really hard, just kind of soft, walnut-like. Well, if you have an enlarged prostate, this is pretty dang large. So we grade them a plus one, plus two, plus three, three plus. This is a huge prostate here. And as you can see up here, look at here, this is the bladder and this is the urethra, and look what happens when it gets large. It presses on the urethra, so then they have issues with urination. They're getting up all night, peeing. They are um, having difficulty or hesitancy, or they're dribbling. So they, they'll empty the bladder, but not all the way, and then they'll start dribbling. Or they'll have complete obstruction here, which can eventually happen, and they are, end up in the emergency room. You have to put a Foley in to open that up because the prostate's too enlarged for urine to go out. The reason they say benign prostatic hyperplasia is because it's not cancer. It's just a benign enlargement of the prostate cancer due to excessive growth of the epithelial cells and the smooth muscle cells, which makes up the prostate. So there's a couple medications that are used, not used as much anymore, but this inhibits the 5-alpha reductase, so this would actually help decrease the smooth muscle or the um, epithelial cell growth. It's most effective in patients with a very large prostate uh, and have an obstruction. So it's um, also sold for male pattern baldness. So Proscar is one of them and then Avidart's the other one. It's similar but two differences. It's harmful to developing male fetus so you want to be careful with intercourse if you're trying to get somebody pregnant. Hopefully you wouldn't have that though um, at a younger age. And an extremely long half-life. It's five weeks. These are used most commonly for uh, BPH or enlarged prostate, terazosin, doxazosin, tamzulosin, alfuzosin. These are alpha blockers. So think of beta blockers, alpha blockers. They both will lower blood pressure. Alpha blockers will work on the prostate. Actually, they work more on the urethra to dilate the urethra to help things flow, um, to get things, it, it vasodilates. Well, so can other blood pressure medications that lower the blood pressure. So you have to be careful when you're mixing blood pressure medications with these medications, because these are alpha blockers. They relax the smooth muscles, therefore decrease your blood pressure. If you're taking them along with something else, you have to watch for hypotension. Okay, these are selective for alpha-1 receptors in the prostate, and what they also do is block alpha receptors in the blood vessels, and they promote vasodilatation and can lower blood pressure. So you have alpha receptors in the prostate, and the hytrin, the terazo, that's for Flomax and Uroxetrol, and your hytrin and doxazosin, Cardura, also block alpha receptors in your blood vessels. They both promote vasodilation, dilatation, and can lower blood pressure. So this one here is under these two, but this one should be under both because that's what they do. They vasodilate and lower blood pressure. Okay, Tamsulosin, the Flomax, and the Aroxetrol, Alphazosin, less likely to cause the effects of Terazosin, Doxazosin. Um, Tamsulosin, which is Flomax, is given most commonly, and it can cause abnormal ejaculation. Another reason why we give these medications, especially Flomax, is for kidney stones. If someone has a kidney stone and it's stuck somewhere in the urethra, we give Flomax to uh, vasodilate, open up the urethra and get that the kidney with the urine um, flowing well. But what can also happen is abnormal ejaculation. So the ejaculate can actually uh, kind of reflux or go back. So you actually feel like you're going to ejaculate, but you don't. And so it, men can feel very uncomfortable with this um, and uh, don't like it. 
Um, I would see this a lot with uh, men that would, younger men that would have renal st kidney stones. They'd come in freaking out because they're like, something's wrong with me. So the hytrin and cardura can cause hypotension, fainting, dizziness, somnolence, and nasal congestion. Although, again, this also has a component of vasodilation, dilatation. Uh, these are more likely to cause that, which is probably why Jenny Vernon put this down here. So when you're thinking testing terazosin or terazosin doxazosin, you have to be real much more careful with hypotension. If you're going to have hypotension, if you're, you can have some fainting and some dizziness, somnolence, and nasal congestion. They do not decrease PSA levels, so they really have nothing to do with the uh, prostate, prostatic specific antigen levels, which have to do with uh, cancer. Um, why are these antigens being overproduced in the prostate? So it could be because of cancer, because you have some abnormal, abnormal, more malignant cell growth, or um, you can have increasing with prostatitis. So inflammation of the prostate can increase the PSA. Usually in cancer, the PSA will be elevated a little bit. If you have inflammation, it's going to be double to triple the normal uh, PSA level. So what are you going to do? So you're obviously going to do a complete history, get their medications, urinary elimination problems, potential contraindications. So think about what the prostate's doing. If it's enlarged, it's squeezing on that or obstructing or trying to obstruct the um, <clears throat> Uh, the urethra so you can't get the urine out so urinary elimination problem so what's going on how are you you're up at night urinating a lot are you dribbling when you go to the bathroom do you feel like you have trouble starting your stream do you have trouble stopping your stream um, and then obviously the people that come in with their catheters because they ended up in the ER with obstruction you're gonna uh, you're gonna get some vital signs weight height serum electrolyte levels those are just basics that you're going to get um, on that. Okay, so drug interactions. So you're going to watch their blood pressure, look at all their other medications, which again brings you back to this. What You're looking at their medication history. What if they come in and they're on to a blood pressure med and they're on, um, say, doxazosin too? What, what's their blood pressure? Why are they having hypotension? You look at the drugs. Many symptoms that patients have, you look at their medication list, and many times you can solve the problem easily by point, pointing out a medication. So you want to be careful when you're mixing these with any of these. As, as well as the Cialis, Levitra, and Viagra used for erectile dysfunction and inhibitors of CYP3A4. 3, 3, and remember, that is the pathway in the liver in which certain drugs are metabolized. And so if you put two in the same pathway and you're taking them at the same time, you want to be careful because it's going to either enhance one or decrease the other one. There's some other drugs that are used, although um, saw palmetto, which is over-the-counter, it's an herb. A lot of people use it, but again, the evidence isn't real strong that it works. It's one of those things, well, it's not really going to hurt, so you can try it. If you don't notice anything, then, you know, you probably need something else. Uh, Detrol is used for overactive bladder. We don't really see that too much anymore. The PDE5 inhibitors for BPH, Cialis, which is the one that is indicated for benign, benign prostatic hypertrophy, um, and the botulism. So again, that's more uh, last stitch effort, which but it's sometimes done because remember it relaxes the muscle, relaxes the muscles um, around that prostate area, which would relax then um, the urethra or open the urethra up, I should say. So with any of these medications, you want to make sure that their kidneys are functioning fine, their liver's functioning fine, because you're thinking about metabolism of the medication. Assess the PSA levels and a DRE, a digital rectal exam, before beginning any drugs. Why do you want to do this? Because you want to make sure they don't have any cancer underlying. Uh, so that's the first thing you have to do is exclude cancer. Uh, so if you get a P and the other thing, you should always match a PSA with the DRE. 
the PSA without a DRE doesn't really do any good as far as evidence goes. Uh, if you check a, uh, say the PSA uh, level is sky high or three times more than what it was and you do the rectal exam and it's tender, putting those two together you're saying is probably is prostatitis. What if you perform a digital rectal exam and you feel a hard nodule but yet fail to get the PSA level? Uh, they could have cancer and you're missing that. So, and you have to think too, the digital rectal exam is a subjective exam. I could check it and say, yeah, it's a two plus size. And then you can check it and say, it's a plus one. So it is more subjective, but it really is helpful when matched with the PSA because if you're feeling anything abnormal there, you gotta get, automatically just get a PSA when you're doing the DRE. Not like you guys are going to be doing this. We do it as clinicians, but it's good to understand why we're doing what we're doing. All right, so these are just some other implications here. So I am testosterone should be given deeply. Choose your landmarks carefully. Uh, follow exact instructions for sublingual buckle and buccal buckle, I say buckle, and PO forms, oral forms. And transdermal testoderm patches go on the scrotal skin, which I don't see very often. Uh, and transdermal androderm is applied to the skin on the body, never to the scrotal skin. So what this tells you overall is that testosterone is given in many different avenues. Um, I would say at this point, I am testosterone. Some people still come in and get them, especially men that have been on it for a long time. They'll come in for their uh, I am testosterone injections. But we see a lot of gel, androgel, um, uh, patches and that kind of stuff. You have to remember too, um, actually let's go back to this testosterone. If you have a patch or a gel um, on, you want to make sure kids aren't touching that um, or really anybody because you don't want them getting some testosterone because remember that's going through the skin. So if it's going through the skin and then someone touches it, it can go through their skin. And that can be dangerous. For finasteride, uh, you have to be careful because that's um, what they say is more of a cancer um, cancer type drug, chemotherapy type drug. So you have to be careful um, if you are handling finasteride. If you're giving out medications like this in the nursing unit, you put on gloves when you're giving this. Pregnant woman should not handle crushed or broken finasteride tablets. So you put on gloves or pregnant females maybe that are nurses have their co-workers do it. Obviously with education you want to educate and you want to monitor them and see if it's working and also monitor for effects. So every time you see them you're going to ask them what's working, what's not working, um, and get a full history. If you're inpatient, if they're inpatient, um, let's just say they had a prostatectomy. Uh, now for Say they had a prostatectomy or resection, I should say, uh, for um, enlargement, and they had an obstruction. Now you can kind of look back and be like, oh, this is why they were on this medication. Or you can ask them, were you taking any, medic any medications for this prior, and kind of understand why they, why they were taking medications and what led them to getting this resection, because sometimes medications fail. And as far as testosterone, it's good to know the side effects of this because if patients come in on that, you really need to know why they're on it, if they're having any side effects to it. All right, and that is it for the slide. Now I'm going to give some little tidbits, hints. Let me see if I can get back to a full screen here. Huh? Actually, let me get out of that. Whoopsie. Get back to my screen. So that's not working. Okay, well. I guess I'll just stay right here. Okay, so um, if you're giving uh, testosterone injections, again, I'm looking at my notes, so if you're giving testosterone injections, how do you give those? Well, usually injections are given about every two to four weeks for about three to four years, and you're having them come in frequently and you're checking their testosterone levels. You're not necessarily checking the levels every two to four weeks at all, but you could be checking them, say, every quarter, um, in the beginning, you want to check it a little bit more, 
because obviously they're new to the drug and you want to make sure that um, they are tolerating it. But usually the IM injections are every two to four weeks and you keep them on it about three to four years because there's side effects to these adverse reactions. And so uh, we don't want it causing cancer or being on it lifelong. You will see people that have been on it for years. Uh, again, they're the um, the outlier that really maybe shouldn't be on it, but again, you see you'll think you'll see things in the medical field that you're like that's not right, but now you know you're gonna learn what's not right and what's right, okay? <laughs> so um, and just also remember that sometimes younger kids can be on this because they're having issues with um, not developing and not going through puberty, so sometimes they can be put on testosterone injections. Um, and they will it'll be the same dose for them too it'll be every two to four weeks usually they'll stay on it um, for a short amount of time um, okay so that is one okay and actually what I'm gonna do is go back to the beginning here and see if this is in the slide okay yeah so the androgen abuse I want to go back to that let me just see if it has anything Okay, so I want you to really pay attention to adverse effects because what if you have a kid come in or, or even a young adult or anybody and uh, they come in and they're uh, telling you, whoops, they're telling you that, um, um, or actually they're not telling you, hold on, ah. okay, let's just say that this is a young male that is not developing like he should, meaning he's overdeveloped, okay? And so you, what are those symptoms if you're overdeveloping? If you are 12 years old, you shouldn't have a deep voice, right? At that point, I mean, maybe you went through puberty earlier, but if you have excessive hair or let's just say, remember um, what we said about if you're young and you're taking those, you're, the growth plates, the epiphyseal, epiphyseal closure is um, going to be premature, so then you're going to stop growing um, sooner. So you have a short stature. So let's just say you're like, gosh, this kid is too small, but he's got a really deep voice and a lot of facial hair going on. Maybe you might suspect that he is um, taking too much or he is um, taking um, anabolic steroids. So what kind of things do you need to look out for? So remember here, what kind of labs would you get on this person? So if you're looking here, let's see, virilization. Well, there's no lab to determine this. You can look at him and say, well, he's under the growth chart, let's say, for his height. Hepatotoxicity, what does that mean? Hepato's liver toxicity is you're toxic in the liver. So I might want to check a liver panel. Effects on cholesterol. Well, we can do a blood test on that, so we might want to check that. So we can get a, a lipid panel, which is your cholesterol, and we can get a liver panel, pregnancy, use in pregnant. You don't want to use it when you're pregnant. If this is a female, I would just, that would not be good. I've never seen a female use them, but hey, I guess you'd want to get an HCG, a pregnancy test. Prostate cancer, so if they're older, you might want to get a PSA with the digital rectal exam. Edema, you may want to check electrolytes if you're seeing that, gynecomastia. So I would say out of these, what labs are you going to get? You're going to get a liver panel and you're going to get a lipid panel because you can see that those are adverse effects um, in that. So that is the best answer uh, for that, um, that scenario. Remember when you're taking, when for erectile dysfunction, know your medications for that. If you're taking Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis, Cialis is the longest acting. The other ones are up to 36 hours. You can take it daily. That's the one medication that can be used for the benign, God, I can't talk today whatsoever, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Um, and just know how you should be taking these medications one hour before sexual activity. Remember not to take with a high-fat meal because that can decrease absorption. And know the adverse effects of this medication. So going back to adverse effects again, I'm still on the slide. When I say edema, when, 
you say edema, what else can be going on in the body? Um, they could have, they're obviously having fluid retention. Well, sodium chloride, sodium and water, they um, go together, so you're probably retaining um, sodium. So you probably want to check their weight if they are um, um, having some edema and they're taking, let's just say, some testosterone, they're on a testosterone patch. Because uh, remember, androgens, testosterone goes under androgen therapy, so any side effect to um, testosterone can be all of these too. So if somebody is taking androgen therapy for, say, their lack of developing um, and they come in, one of the things you want to check, well, all of these you want to check, uh, but you're going to check symptoms too. Do you have enlarged breasts, uh, gynecomastia, are you having any edema? What are you going to do if they have these things? So just know that um, you're going to be checking weight is very important with that um, um, because that can mess up electrolytes, uh, et cetera. That's probably the most serious. They can have other issues. Um, you know, what if they have a patch on and they have a rash? Yes, that can be, you know, easily treated and um, easily solved, uh, but... The weight gain, you want to really pay attention to that. If they just have one or two pounds, that's fine. But what you're watching for is more of a significant weight gain, like, um, you know, three to five pounds and more. The one thing with erectile dysfunction, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of it is psychological reasons. So if somebody has, uh, so let's just say in a healthy man with no issues and, uh, really not having any erectile dysfunction issues, and his friends say, hey, take this Viagra, it's really going to help make it better. Um, it's going to make your erection last longer. It really does not. So in healthy men, these medications um, do not have any effect on erectile dysfunction whatsoever. I know there wasn't much uh, as far as slides go with children and testosterone, so that's why I am keep bringing this up. So when you're a teenager and you're not developing, you can um, end up having some testosterone replacement, whether it's a patch or usually they'll put them on the patch, which I think I have a picture of a kid somewhere here. Nope, we'll go back to that. I've got a picture some, maybe not. I don't know. There's a picture I have. saw a picture somewhere. Anyway, so think about what's happening with um, a child. They're not going through puberty, which means they're not having the appropriate testosterone um, secretion. So something is going on with the hormones, so they need to take a testosterone replacement to help them go through puberty. So what are the symptoms that you're going to see, signs I should say, that you should see when they come back to see you? So you should see what? You should see acne, right? Because what happens to the oil glands? They start producing oil more. Your um, um, your, um, oh, I cannot talk today, your hair, your follicles, it produces sebum. Maybe I need a drink. <laughs> um, I don't really drink, so I just didn't want you to think I'm a drinker, but man, I'm just stumbling today. Anyways, um, but I know, I know in my head what I'm talking about. So it can cause acne. Why? Because you're putting them through puberty, right? You're giving them that uh, testosterone. They're going to start growing. You want them to grow. So they're going to um, increase in height. They're going to increase in weight. Now I know in the la just a minute ago I talked about watching for weight gain. What you're watching for is sudden gains in weight. So you you tell you this is what you're going to do. You're going to tell them to go home and say, you know what? Just weigh yourself once a week. If you're like five pounds up in like three days or five days, say twice a week, weigh yourself. Then call the office. Take a look at your ankles. Are you swollen? When I say weight gain, it's because you're growing. So that's a healthy growth. So if they're coming in, they're having a steady, nice weight gain along with their height increasing, that's healthy. That's what we want. So when I say um, weight gain on the prior one and edema, we're really focusing on that side effect, adverse reaction of taking testosterone, which would be edema. So you're looking for sudden, kind of like someone with heart failure. Things are backing up, fluids backing up. So one way we tell them to do is you have to weigh themselves every day. If they gain more than um, three pounds in 24 hours and five pounds in five days, they need to call because then that says, oh, you've got fluid overload. So it's that sudden 
weight gain from the edema that can throw off your fluid and electrolytes, but the benefits of it is they're going through puberty now, right? So they have, they're getting facial hair, they are growing, they're getting taller, uh, which means that their skeletal muscle is growing, um, they're getting a deeper voice, and um, it's not causing that premature epiphyseal closure, those growth plates, and they can get acne. The other thing to remember, as I mentioned before too, with the uh, like androgel or the gel that men put on uh, their skin for testosterone replacement, not to let kids get a hold of it. Reason being is number one, it increases testosterone, and if you give children too much testosterone and they don't need it, it can cause aggression. So think about too with people that take testosterone don't need it, it can cause aggression. So behavioral issues in children, not only is it bad for them as far as um, uh, reproduction and um, issues, you just don't want to give it if they don't need it. That could be dangerous. The one slide that I want to go back to is just to remind you of um, is, okay, so this one here, it says that the nitrates, 24 hours in between these medications for safety. Um, and then on the next slide, it'll say should not use it at all. I want you to stick with not using it at all. So I just want to make mention of that. Because if you have a patient that comes in and they say they occasionally use it or something, I, I'm i just too careful with that. And it really is on the adverse reactions to really not take, you should not take nitrites at all with that med with, um taking any of these types of medications. So I um, wanted to let you know that. The other thing is just remember which ones, you know, what, what are short acting, what are long acting. Remember Cialis can be used um, on a daily basis uh, because, and it has a really long half-life of 36 hours. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, if they're saying that they need it for intercourse, five days a week, maybe you want to put them on Cialis, right? <laughs> so instead of taking the Viagra every day, just put them on a daily dose of the Cialis because it's proven um, uh, safe. Okay, so going back to um, these children again and these um, androgen replacements, testosterone replacements, I had mentioned that they're on testosterone usually for about three to four years. The children, even adults too, we watch them um, and, you know, we will try to take them off it. And obviously we will see some people that are on it longer. But for children, you definitely will take them off it because you're looking for the testicular enlargement. Uh, so it's usually about three to four years. But um, the reason why they're going on the estrogen, because remember their tes testicles are small hypogonadism. So that's telling you that they are not their testosterone is not being secreted like it should. There's a dysregulation in that. They're not going through puberty, so they need the testosterone. So once they start having that enlargement in the testicular growth, that is a good sign that says, okay, maybe we need to, we can take them off the, um, the androgens, meaning testosterone replacement. Okay, and that's it. So really pay attention to uh, what I say during the slides. Pay attention to the last portion that I discussed in the slide section. If you have any questions, please let me know. And that is it.